So today we are in week four of a series that we started at the beginning of the year in, entitled Standing on the Promises, Standing on the Promises. And for the last couple of weeks, we've been unpacking the beautiful truths of Romans chapter eight. And of course, my thesis throughout this series has been, what are some uh, assurances? What are some guarantees? What are some promises of God from the Bible that are true about ourselves, that are true about God, that we can stand on, we can anchor ourselves to in 2024? No matter what comes our way this year, no matter what you may be facing, we can stand with confidence on who we are and whose we are and what God's promises towards us are. So if you've been with us throughout this series, a key theme in the entire chapter, you've probably picked up on this, is assurance. And in the first 17 verses, we saw this great assurance of God's people in the face of sin, in the face of our brokenness. We are assured that there is now no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. We can be assured that we have been given the righteousness of Jesus. We can be assured that we are children of God. We can be assured that we have received the Spirit of God. And when the Spirit has moved in, we have also received last week the Spirit of sin. Sonship, and we are uh, in a new relationship now with God, one where we relate to Him differently. We have a relational approach to God where we even describe Him and, and address Him differently. And, and then finally, we learn that <clears throat> we are heirs. Everything that God has, we have. Everything that Jesus has been given, we have been given. We are co heirs with Christ. These are all powerful truths about God and about what the Holy Spirit has done in us. Now, the second half of Romans that we enter in uh, today, the second half of chapter 8, the focus shifts on assurance from assurance, but not in the face of sin, but assurance now in the face of suffering. Suffering. So many have called Romans chapter 8 one of the most significant uh, chapters in the Bible for us to know, which is, which is good news, because uh, if we're going to have a, a passage in the Bible that is supposed to be one of the passages that means the most to us, I want to be sure that it addresses some of the real-life issues that we all face, including hardship, including pain, including sufferings. And some of us are experiencing those things right now. Some of us are struggling right now, and all of us at some point in life in various ways, will experience pain, suffering. Now, before we jump into our text, I want to just kind of uh, take you to theology school, okay? Don't let that scare you. I'm going to try to explain it as uh, these big words as, as best as I can. But I want to uh, help you bring some clarity uh, to some theological terms that some people kind of throw around and just assume that everybody uh, knows. But there are three major doctrines to the Christian life. Now, here's the big word alert, so I'll explain them. Uh, justification, sanctification, and glorification. Okay, real easy way to remember these is the past, the present, and the future. So justification has to do with the past. That was Romans 8, 1 through 4, where we are made right with God. We have right standing with God because of what Jesus has done on our behalf. So we didn't earn it. We can't earn it. Nothing in our abilities uh, gave us that standing. That was all grace. That was all the grace of God that we receive by faith. Uh, justification means that the penalty of sin has been done away with. We're no longer under condemnation. We talked about this uh, uh, in week one. You have been given the righteousness of Christ. So that's what justification is. Sanctification is all about the present, the real time where we're at today. So this was Romans 8, 5 through uh, 17. This is the more you surrender to the Holy Spirit, the more you grow into the likeness of Jesus. The more you are like him, you are operating in the Holy Spirit and you're letting the Holy Spirit dictate what you do in life. So your desires, your passion, the the things of the flesh are no longer uh, 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 controlling you, are no longer driving your impulses. So let me say it this way. You're growing now. You're learning how to grow into this new identity that you have been given as a son and as a daughter of Jesus. So the power of sin now, the more you surrender to the Holy Spirit, the power of sin starts to diminish in your life daily. So you grow in this sanctification. That's the present. And then glorification is the third big one, or, or glory as it's sometimes discussed. So what we're going to talk about today, that has to deal with the future, where one day we'll see God has promised all things are going to be made right. So it's not just that we're free from the penalty of sin. It's not just that we're released from the power of sin, but the presence of sin itself one day will be done away with. And that is our hope. 
That is what we wait for, this glorious future that is promised to those who believe in Jesus. And our text today is looking forward to that future hope and that reality for those of us who are in Christ. So we're going to pick it up where we left last week, Romans chapter 8. If you don't have your Bibles, you can follow along on the screen. We're going to be in verse 18. We've just been walking line by line, verse by verse, just letting the uh, Word of God encourage us, speak to our hearts, and just kind of remind us of these powerful truths that are for us. So by way of the reminder, the Apostle Paul is writing here to Christians, real people who are living in a Roman context in the city of Rome and in that culture. And this is what he says. Watch this. Now, I consider... That the present sufferings, that word consider there, that, that term in the original language means to compute, means to, to calculate, to, to, okay, what does this equal? What's the bottom line here, right? That's what that word says, and it means, and he says, I consider that our present sufferings, the things that we can see, the things that we can feel, all the things that bring us anguish and emotional trauma, all those things that we all wrestle with on a daily basis, all those sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Now, I want you to notice right off the bat in, in this passage that Paul links two themes together that we probably would never put together, suffering and glory. As one commentator put it, um, he said, uh, hurts and hallelujahs. <laughs> I like that. So, so Paul is showing us here that as Christians, we are fundamentally a forward-looking people. We are looking ahead to the glory coming to those who believe. So Paul says here, I've calculated, I've thought about this, and the suffering in your life is real. He's not diminishing it. He, he's not minimizing our pain or our suffering. He says, but I've done the math. I, I've done the homework. And our future glory weighs far more than what we are presently suffering. So we have present sufferings, and they are real, and it's different for everybody, but the weight of the future glory doesn't even compare to what we're dealing with today. Now, in that culture, when Paul would have made a statement like that, uh, the people would have thought about something like this, uh, a scale, because scales, often what they did in that culture, they weighed things. So when you would buy things, you would put something on a scale, and then, you know, whatever weighed more, that's how you would make a purchase. And Paul is saying, listen, I know that your current sufferings, right, and they're real, and they're painful. You, you may have gotten a bad cancer diagnosis, right? Uh, it's, the, the prognosis is not good. So, so you can take maybe like a, a little rock that says cancer and put it on one end of the scale. Uh, the divorce that may be looming or that relational trauma that you may have, it's real. Now we just added another rock. The, the, the job struggle, it's real. It's a weight. Living in a fallen world is taking a toll on you. It's real. The worry that you face, the anxiety that is plaguing your life, the the, the pr- that you're battling, it's real. The, the wayward child that keeps you up at night, that you're just praying for and groaning for and wishing they would return to Jesus, all those things are little pebbles that, that kind of tip the scales. And, 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 and the guilt that you may be facing or, or, or you know, the, the sin in your life that plagues you is, is real and, and the losses in your life, they're real, right? Uh, just yesterday, I, I did a funeral for a person here at Journey Church and, and it was a beautiful time of celebration and it was a beautiful time of remembrance and storytelling. And, and this person lived an amazing life. And, and tragically, cancer kind of uh, ended his life uh, uh, in, in, his, in his 60s. But, but you can feel that, right? Like, here's this, this, this amazing man that lived an awesome life, but, but cancer was real. The suffering was real. And even though we, we, we shared great stories, people still had a heaviness. All those things are real. Now, think about this. The scale is tipped in one direction uh, it, it, pretty, pretty bad, right? There's a lot of losses. But Paul says here, but hey, I've done my homework. I've done the math. And although the weight of all that, uh, the fallen and broken world that we've, we're living in, I've calculated, I've compared to the glory that is revealed in us, the future day that is coming, the future glory that all of us at one point in time will experience weighs far more than all these present sufferings we go through. Our future glory is so intense and so phenomenal that it's not even worth comparing so think about all those little pebbles and all those things that are weighing over here. Now somebody comes with a gold bar and just tips the scales and puts it on that other one. And you just see the scales start to kind of tip and the gold bar starts to uh, kind of rise to the uh, drop to the bottom because it, it weighs more. 
That, that's kind of the, what he's saying here. Uh, James Boyce, he was a Presbyterian pastor, and he died several years ago, and he says this about this passage. He says that our future glory weighs more than our current sufferings in two ways. One is duration, so it lasts longer, and two is intensity. So the intensity of our future weighs more than the intensity of our pain. James says that the apostle here is saying that when you're going through the intensity of your suffering, just look at the immensity of the future that's waiting for you. Because the intensity of your suffering only points to the great glory, the immensity of what is coming. Because what is coming is so glorious that when we experience here on earth, pales in comparison to what will one day be. And so in many ways, that's often how we calculate things in life. That's how we make decisions, right? Think about this. It's it, duration. Is, is it worth it? And intensity. How long will it last? For example, let me give you a couple examples here. When you go to Disneyland, who's ever, anybody ever been to Disneyland, right? And you stand outside of your favorite ride, okay? Uh, cars or, um, you know, Splash Mountain, but I, I just heard that they renamed it because it was, um, you know, offensive to some people. Uh, anyway, uh, it's, it's fine. It's, it's cool. But you're sitting there in front of that ride, and it says over there, boom, 60 minutes wait time to get on this ride, right? Now, as you're doing that, you got crying kids, it's hot, you're sweating, you know, it's just, it's just frustrating, and you got to make a decision. Is this ride for three minutes worth me sitting in this line for 60 minutes of my time? Is the intensity, the pleasure of the ride, right, that three minutes, is it going to be worth the 60-minute wait time? Guess what? Bizarrely, thousands and thousands and thousands of people say, yes, it is. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> but when it comes to our sufferings, the Apostle Paul says, actually, the opposite is true. Your future is longer in duration and way more intense and pleasurable than your current sufferings. My son Levi, for let me give you another example. He loves dessert. Okay, he has a he has a sweet tooth, kind of like his dad. Well, as a kid, and, and even now, uh, sometimes when, when he wants dessert, uh, guess what we say? He's eleven. Got to eat your vegetables first, son. Right? And so what we do is we let him choose. We let him calculate. We let him kind of explore and consider. Here's this cake. It's awesome. It's good. It's, it's homemade. It's, it's the best you've ever had, but you got to suffer through the green beans, <laughs> All right? And if you don't want to suffer through the green beans, then guess what? You don't get cake. So it's, it's up to you. But if you're going to eat the cake and you're going to suffer, uh, you got to suffer through the green beans. And if you don't want to suffer through the green beans, then you don't get the cake. And oftentimes what we would do just to kind of incentivize him is as he's eating, you know, what he called little green trees, broccoli or, or <laughs> um, uh, the green beans, as he's eating those, we would just put the cake right in front of them, right? So he's like, he's eating all this stuff, but his eyes are... Whoa, this is, yeah, he's suffering through the pain because of the future that's waiting for him. It's going to be fantastic, the future glory of that cake, right? It's exactly what the Apostle Paul is doing here, right? In essence, he's saying, keep your eyes on the glory that is about to be revealed to you. Here's how he says it, in fact, to the uh, Corinthian church. He says this, for our light, watch this, and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So what do we do? We fix our eyes, just like we did with my son. Fix your eyes, son, on the cake. I know that this sucks. I know that these vegetables are no good. Fix your eyes on that. So he says, fix your eyes on not what is seen, so the world, the problems, the pain, the suffering, but on what is unseen. You know what's unseen? Heaven, everybody. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen, that's what's eternal. That's what's going to last. See, in a very real way, we are reminded of this truth. Heaven is our home, not earth, everybody. If you're a believer in Christ, that's the future glory that we're headed towards, heaven. And a habit we would do well uh, to remember and to focus on is the long term and not the short term. So we're playing the long game, not the short term game. Just this week, I read a, a fascinating article. It was a really famous article. You can look it up from Harvard University. And they did a study, and they figured out that the more long term that your thinking is, the more successful you're going to be in life. 
And instead, the shorter term you're thinking is, the more failure you're going to have in life. People who are, are, are short-term thinkers, they're only thinking about today. They're only thinking about the pleasures of today. They're only thinking about what feels good right now. Their life is not going to be as successful as those who have this long-term, long-game approach. And, 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 and they can see uh, what's coming, and, and, and they're going to wait. And they can be, uh, in fact, the article said that they're going to be the most successful people, those that have long-term thinking. Now, as Christians, uh, we, we can win at that game hands down, right? Because when we think in long terms, we're thinking about eternity. That's what we call it, heaven. Because we're not just thinking about the here and now. We're not just thinking about this 40, 50, 60 years that, that, that some of us have left. We're thinking about trillions and trillions and trillions of years into the future. And living in light of eternity, keeping our eyes on that, is the key to being successful here on life. Because everything wraps itself about into th- that reality. See, the reason we struggle uh, to wrap our minds around this first is because many of us are living for the here and now. This earth is not our final destination, and we've lost the sense as believers of where our true home is. Uh, We really have. Listen, everybody, you're just passing through. You're just passing through. This is not your home. We, we really don't live here. We, we're, we're just passing through. In fact, it's, it's one of the best pastoral things I could ever uh, give to you, really, is, is to tell you, hey, I know it's tough right now. I know that pain is real. I know there's struggle. Jesus promised us that that's what it would be like, that life would be tough. He says, in this life, you will have troubles, but hang in there. This is not permanent. Why? Because this is not our home. You're just passing through. I remember uh, growing up, my grandparents, and this is, uh, you know, generations ago, and, and this generation, it, you know, for some reason, getting them this concept is very difficult to understand, but, but our grandparents, you guys probably remember this, some old church mothers uh, of old, man, what do they always talk about? Heaven! Heaven, heaven is our home. And I could always hear, I can even imagine myself now uh, hearing my grandma say, this earth sucks! I mean, that, those are my language. That was my words, but you know, loosely translated from the Romanian language, okay? <laughs> but she would say, this, I'm tired of this earth. Like, there, there's nothing good here. I want to go to heaven. That's my eternal home. You know, and she would always, there were those old church mothers, I'll fly away, oh glory. When's the last time we sang that song? I'll fly away. He's like, last week. <laughs> good for you. <laughs> When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. Man, that's a, that's a big reality. But a lot of us don't see our lives that way. We've really lost uh, that reality. Why? Because we're, we're blindingly too comfortable. This earth has become blindingly too good. See, the better we have it, the more we think this is all that it's about. And listen, I don't blame you. We have it awesome in the Northwest here, right? We have rivers, we have mountains, we have trees, we have amazing hiking trails, we have amazing views, we have amazing uh, 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 sunsets and sunrises, we have granola and Whole Foods. I get it. Like, we're awesome here in the Northwest, right? But what Paul is saying here is like, hey, this is not it, everybody. That's why Paul could say, by the way, in person, which, uh, or in prison, which says a lot uh, about him and, and makes it, in, in some regards, easier to say this, but watch what he says. Many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Watch this. Their destiny is destruction. Their God, what does it say? Is their stomachs. So their God is indulgence, is in, in enjoyment. Now listen, there's nothing wrong with enjoyment. There's nothing wrong with uh, indulgement, but it just can't become your God. And then he says, the glory is in their shame. And then he tells us why they're enemies of Christ. Here's what it says. Their mind is set on earth. It's set on earthly things. And he goes on to say, but our citizenship is where, everybody? Heaven, heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior to come from there, our Lord Jesus Christ. Look, we can't lose sight of our real home, everybody. We need to keep our eyes on the glory that is to come. And the apostle is saying, as weighty as the suffering is, as hard as it is, and and I I really do empathize with some of us that are going through a lot of pain right now, but listen, your future weighs even more. 
It's, it, it, your future is glorious. Your future is more intense. It's just a beautiful thing that's waiting for us. Now, if, if somebody's writing to you uh, about suffering or having this kind of conversation to you, you want to be ma- you you want to make sure that this person is not an armchair quarterback sufferer. <laughs> right? You, uh, you, you guys know what an armchair quarterback is? Uh, most of us by the end of tonight are going to be armchair quarterbacks, okay? We're going to be yelling at the TV screens, thinking about why couldn't he, you know, and, and what do we do? We got our hands full of Cheetos. We got two liters of Diet Coke next to our uh, uh, chair, and we're like, he should have done this. He should have passed it that way. Never mind that we can't even throw a football or we can't even barely get up off the couch, but, but that's what they should have done, right? Armchair quarterbacks all over the place. Well, well listen, Paul was not that. Paul was a guy who, who understood suffering. And he says, hey, listen, I, I've done the math. I've calculated. I've experienced this. I, I've experienced tremendous suffering. Let me remind you or, or show you some of the sufferings that he's, he's, he's been a part of. Listen to this. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. This is uh, the same thing that Jesus received. By the way, the reason that they, it would be 40 uh, or 39 and not 40, they would, uh, the, the Romans would hit you so hard with the whip that it was so intense that they would say that the 40th lash that you would receive would actually kill you. That's how bad they were getting whipped. He says, five times I've received that from the Jews, the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten, beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. <laughs> Not that kind of stoned. And some of you are like, man, at least he got some relief, <laughs> right? No, he was stoned. <laughs> bad pastor, bad pastor. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he says, three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in open sea. I have been constantly on the move. Now watch this. I want you to notice how many times he says the word danger. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger uh, of my false brothers. I mean, this is Captain Danger, right? That's who he is. And then he says, I've labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and I have been naked. I wrote 13 books in the New Testament. And I asked Jesus repeatedly, take this pain from me. He had his own pain. He had his own struggle. And Jesus says, no, no, my grace is sufficient to you. I mean, this guy suffered, right? And he says, but our present sufferings? are worth comparing to the glory that's going to be revealed in us. Do you guys catch that? It's not going to be revealed to us. It's revealed in us. That means that glory is already there. And when we get to heaven, it's just going to be exposed and revealed. And hey, it's always been there. There it is. God has put this glory in us right now. It's going to be revealed then and there. And he's essentially saying, if you want to get through this current sufferings, you look to the future glory where when Jesus comes and makes everything right and new. That's what he's writing here in verse 18. Powerful anchor verse for our subject matter today. Now let's read verses 19 to 27, the rest of the chapter, and then we're going to uh, unpack uh, those together. Here's what these say. So the creation, watch this, waits in eager expectation. One uh, author says that the creation is waiting on its tippy toes, like bated breath with their necks broken. When is this going to happen, right? For the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration. Uh, One translation says subjected to futility or subjected to a curse. Not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. But watch how it was subjected. In hope, that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay. So, so sin has not only wrecked the human heart, it's wrecked the world. It's wrecked the earth. It's, it's wrecked creation. And it's waiting and, and groaning with anticipation for when it's going to be made right. It goes on to say, and it's brought into this glorious freedom of the children of God. That's what creation is waiting for. We know that the whole creation has been, keyword here, groaning as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, here's another term, 
groan. The second time it says it, inwardly, as we wait eagerly for a, the adoption as sons. So, so we have that status. We're sons. We talked about this last week. Uh, it's just we, we live in this kind of uh, not yet already kind of dichotomy where, where we're there, but it hasn't been fully fully uh, entered into. That's the, the glorification that we started with. Like That's the glory that we're going to be redeemed. And what is that glory? He tells us. It's the redemption of our bodies. Okay, For in this hope, there is the second time it says hope, we are saved. But hope that is seen is not hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. And then it closes out, in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans. There's the third word it says, groans, that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. Okay, that's a mouthful. We're going to unpack it um, this way. Three things I want you to see that happens to those of us who are believers who are moving from this present suffering into glory. These are the things that are going to happen as we move through this process. And this move is going to mean three things for us. Here's the first one. Write it down. We're moving from groans to glory. From groans to glory. Now, in the passage we just read, we saw that word groans three times, right? So creation groans, it said, as, as, as with pains of childbirth in the uh, Original King James Version, it says, travaileth uh, with childbirths, like the toils and the pains of, of childbirth as it waits for the sons of God to be revealed. And then the passage says that we, not just creation, but we groan internally as, as we eagerly await the redemption of our bodies. And then it says the Spirit of God also groans as well. I mean, there's a lot of groaning going on in the verses we just read. This groaning is a longing for things to be made right, for things to be made new, for the things to become perfect again like God always intended it. And Paul in, in these verses describes how, how sin has, has damaged the world. In other words, everything in this world is broken. Everything in this world is not the way that it was originally designed. Everything in this world is suffering. Everything in this world is in pain. Everything and everyone in this world is frustrated and experiencing all these bad things because it was all broken down by sin. And I think that word groaning is, is a good way to describe a lot of our human experience. I really do. Uh, in, in three days, my son's going to turn 12 years old. But Adela and I have been struggling with infertility ever since. And for years, groaning was the best way to, to uh, describe that process. I would go to sleep at night praying, begging, groaning, like, God, please, please make it so we could have more kids. We, we love kids. We want to have, my wife is great with kids. Can you please, God, Lord, please intervene. I'd wake up in the middle of the night with just, just this groan, just this, like, just this, this, this pain that, that it wasn't happening. When uh, my wife lost uh, a younger sibling at the age of 23, very tragically, 13 years ago, right? There were years of this groaning, of restlessness, going to sleep uh, at night, just groaning for, man, if I could just have one more conversation with him, if I could have just told him how much I loved him, if I, one more opportunity to show her love to her brother, Right? There's just this groaning. We all experience this. Uh, funny story in Mark chapter 7. Uh, Jesus is passing through a region of Galilee. And uh, they brought him a man who couldn't hear and who couldn't speak. And they begged Jesus, Jesus, would you do something about this guy? Please place your hands on him and heal him. Now watch uh, the story. After he took him aside, away from the crowd, Jesus put his... This is crazy. Jesus puts his fingers into this man's ears. Then he pulls his fingers out. He spits on his fingers, like kind of like a wet willy like, right? And then instead of going back to his ears, he goes to his tongue. He looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, Epaphetha, right? <laughs> Which means be opened. At this, the man's ears were opened, his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak plainly. Now, I love this story about Jesus um, because he doesn't give us a pattern. Every time you see Jesus healing people in the New Testament, he never does it the same. Never again does he use this same model again. And he does this on purpose because he doesn't want us to fall into these traps of, man, this is how you, this is the model. This is the formula for deaf and mute. You just get a wet willy, touch the guy's tongue. You know, you, you say the word that nobody can pronounce and boom, he's going to be healed, right? No, that's not what it says. What, what? 
watch, watch what he says in verse 34. This is what I wanted to highlight. It's, it's underlined. It says, with a deep sigh, he says with him. Now, often when I do something stupid, my wife sighs. She's like, ah, right? If I'm really frustrating or really annoying to her, it often uh, involves like a, a, a eye roll, right? Like a, that, you know, your eyes go white, right? When, when that happens, I'm, I know I'm in trouble, okay? So I just <laughs> knock it off. But the word sigh here <laughs> is the word groan. That's actually what Jesus is doing. Jesus is growing, groaning. Now, it's interesting because you're thinking, Jesus, why are you groaning? What do you mean you're growing? Like, you're about to heal this guy. You can save this guy, but yet you're growing. I, I think it's the same reason why, why Jesus goes to the grave of Lazarus, and he's crying for his friend. He's sighing and, and groaning, and he's acknowledging, man, this isn't the way life is supposed to be. It was never intended to be death. It was never intended to be shut mouths and closed ears and sickness and illness. It was never intended to be like this. And so when, when God placed man in the garden, he was in perfect health, in perfect relationship with God, and in a perfect environment, but we messed it up. Sin entered the world and broke everything. So mankind is broken. The world is broken. Hurts are there. Our homes are messed up. And there's things, diseases, and hurts, and defects. And, and when Jesus looked up to heaven, he groaned because he's like, man, this was never the plan. We, we didn't intend it to be like this. And I put this story out because this groaning is the same thing that's happening in our text. It's all throughout this section in Romans 8. But, but our groaning, listen, according to this verse that we just read, is different than other people, than non-believers. Our groaning, the apostle says, is done with hope. And the author of Hebrews says that this hope is an anchor now to our souls. In fact, it says that the whole creation has been groaning as the pains of childbirth right up to the present age. You see, when a, when a pregnant woman, uh, uh, as she gets closer to deliver, the labor, the labor pains right become more frequent and more intense. Thank God for epidurals. Come on, ladies, say amen right there. I remember in my uh, chaplain days uh, going to both the birthing unit and the oncology unit. And there were groans in both of those units. But one of the units, one of the groanings was filled with excitement and filled with hope for the new life that's about to come. The other groaning in the oncology ward was filled with hopelessness and distress. See, the groaning in the maternity ward is groaning for hope because on the other side of the pain is new life. And this is a good, good illustration of what Paul is saying here. On, on, on one side, you have this pain and suffering and there's this groaning, but man, it, we're doing it in hope because there's something better coming. There's something about to be revealed, a future glory that far outweighs what we're experiencing today. Now, I don't know exactly how the earth groans right now, real time. Maybe it's just wacky weather, earthquake. Uh, natural disasters, I don't know, but I, but I know it's longing for the day when it's going to be revealed to them and, 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 and be set free from all the decay and all the death where, where they're no longer under the curse. So we, as part of creation, groan as well because all of us are, are longing for, for glory, right? That's, that's what we were created to do. We want to move from groans to glory. All of us are, are, are designed for glory. And if you're here and you're not a Christian yet, in fact, this is one of the evidences of God, that there's a longing in all of us, Christians and non-Christians, for glory, for, for beauty. And we live in a great place where, where we see the beauty all around us. It's the reason we sit in, in, in just in, in amazement as we're driving down the 14 going east and just seeing the mag majestic Mount Hood, right? It, and we're in awe of it. The, the reason we go to, to, the, to a lookout or we go to the Columbia Docks and just watch the sunset because it, it's just a, a beautiful thing. It's, it's one of the reasons why if you ride road bikes and you're going up this big hill and you get to the top of this beautiful hill and you just stop and nobody talks to themselves. Nobody talks to each other. You just sit there and stare at the picturesque view. It's not because you're tired. It's because you're like, well, maybe because you're tired. But, but it's because like, whoa, this is so beautiful. Beautiful. You know, it's, it's, it's why, why uh, um, uh, art galleries have benches. You ever thought about that? Why? Because you want to sit and look and stare and, wow, this is beautiful. Look at the glory. Look at the beauty here. It's why when you're on a plane and, and you get down to, to some picturesque scenes, the, the, the pilot comes on. He's like, uh, we're going to tip the wings to the right a little bit. For those of you sitting on the right, look at all those picturesque, beautiful mountain range uh, and, and the beautiful islands of Hawaii. I wish I was in Hawaii, but right? Like you look over and it's just like, wow, that is beautiful. 
right? That's what we were made for. We were made for glory. There, there, there's nothing compares to this future glory that we're going to have with our eternal Savior in eternity. That's what he's saying because he says the Bible says that when Christ returns, we're going to see a glory that we have never seen before. We're going to move from these groans to the ultimate glory, and the glory is going to be revealed to us. But we also read what's fascinating here is that you're going to be revealed to creation as glorious. So the glory is going to be revealed to you, but you're going to be revealed as glorious as well. Well, what does that mean, Pastor? That's actually really good news. Because when Christ returns, he's going to make all things new. The adopted children of God are going to be revealed as glorious. Now, if you were here last week, we talked about the sons of God and, and being adopted. And you may be thinking, well, wait a minute. Aren't we already that? Or are we going to be that? Which, which, which is it, right? Well, this is what the Bible is teaching. In the Roman culture, when you were adopted, you were adopted and you were the heir of that person who adopted you. We talked about this last week. But there was a public ceremony that happened. We have those too, where you go to the courthouse and then they make it all official, where everybody got to see who you were. And the Bible is teaching us that when Jesus comes back for the second time, and you have to understand, Jesus came first 2,000 years ago and came to suffer and to die for us. So he identifies with us in our suffering. And we're only Christians because of his suffering for us on the cross. That's what he did when he first came. But when he returns, he's coming not to suffer. He's coming back as our conquering king. And he will rule and reign over anything. And he's going to make everything right and new. He's going to wipe every tear from every eye. And he's going to make all the things right that are wrong with this earth. That's coming. That's the hope of glory. And at that time, it's going to be revealed us as sons and daughters. This is public revealing that's going to be happening. It's going to be glorious. Here's how uh, one of Jesus's dear friends, John, his disciple says it. Dear friends, now, watch this, we are children of God. So it's a reality for us now. And what will be has not yet been known. But what we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Powerful, powerful truths. All right, so that's number one. We're going to go from groans to glory. Here's number two. We're going to go through these last two quickly, I promise. We're going to move from frustration to freedom. From frustration to freedom. Now, notice in verse 20 that we read ago that everything creation-wise is subjected to frustration. Well, what does that mean? The word is subjected to frustration. And who, 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 who caused it to be fr uh, a frustrating place? Well, if you read the very beginning of the Bible in Genesis 1 through 3, uh, you find the answer. God created the world and everything in it and everything was right and everything was perfect. Everything was at, as it should be. But humanity, we decided to disobey God. And when we disobeyed God, God judged the earth and brought everything unto frustration. So because the fall of man, every part of God's creation was subjected under a curse, under the curse. And, and that's why we all groan. The ground was cursed for Adam's sake. Uh, one commentator actually found this interesting said that the reason uh, roses have thorns is because of us, because of sin. The reason that there's weeds in the earth is because of the fallen nature of everything. The reason that animals kill each other is because of fallen nature. The reason that women have labor pains is because of what we have done when sin entered the world. The reason there is death in the world is because of sin and, and frustration. And, and we're all subject to it. And we're all under this curse of sickness and death and, and, and suffering. Now, now you may say, well, well wait a minute, Pastor. What, was God overreacting? I mean, that's not fair, right? Why did God subject this world to frustration and a curse? Wasn't he overreacting? But remember, God is holy, right? Sin must be judged. And because of sin, he subjected this world to frustration. So we live in a world filled with frustration and, and, and futility. Uh, the writer of Ecclesiastes, Solomon, he talks about, man, everything in this life is meaningless apart from Christ. Because he uses this very word, this, this same word, frustration and futility. I've tried everything in life. I've tried the greatest parties. I've tried success. I've had uh, relationships. I've, I've had all the things that this world can offer you. Influence, affluence, money. And it's all meaningless. It doesn't make sense. It's all futile. The only thing that matters is a relationship with the Lord. That's what he says. Everything in this world, because of the frustration in it, the only thing that does make sense is a relationship with 
with God. And he says, after a while, even what was great, uh, the next generation comes along and says, oh, sorry, that, that's, that's a clunker, right? I remember our uh, kids, um, our former kids ministry lady, she came from a church in Los Gatos, California, a really affluent area, really affluent church. Thomas Kincaid went to their church, everybody. You guys remember him? His paintings were like absurd. Nobody could afford them, right? And so this guy went to that church, and he painted beautiful paintings, like never one-offs that were hanging in the church lobby. I mean, just amazing. People would walk in there and be like just stunned. Well, new pastor comes in. Thomas Kincaid dies 10 years later. They're all just sitting collecting dust in the basement. Me, like what a waste, right? That, that's, that's the curse. That's, that's, that's what's happening to this world. It, not, nothing, it's just, it's just meaning. It's just meaningless. So, so we got to ask ourselves the question, man, why would we want to live forever in a world like this, right? Like this, that's subjected or bound to frustrations. See, there's a lot of talk about extending life right now and a lot of, uh, you know, drinking from the fountain of youth and, and living forever in this world. And scientists are constantly talking about this, trying to figure out how do we live forever. But why would you want to be living forever in a broken world like this? One of the most famous uh, kids' books uh, of all time is called Tuck Everlasting. Some of you guys might have read it. Uh, it's not a Christian book, but this is our secular world kind of pontificating on do we really want to live forever. And Tuck uh, and his family, they drink from the fountain of youth, and, and you would think, man, they would live forever, they're going to be happy, they're going to experience all these great things, but it's miserable because instead of, of, of uniting them and, and bringing them closer, it just divides them. And they only see each other about once every 10 years, and they're separated from community, and they're separated from love. And when you read this, you conclude, wow, everlasting life, it, it, although it sounds good, it's, you, you won't enjoy it in a broken world like ours. But, but here's the good news. When Jesus returns, the world is no longer subjected to that frustration. Everything is returned to its original state. As Jesus comes and kind of hits the reset button. Click, click. Everything goes back to the way it was supposed to be. Everything is right. Everything is perfect. And we're going to enjoy a world in all of its fullness, the, the world that God created in perfection. There will be no more death. There will be no more mourning, no more pain. For all the former, the old order of things, the book of Revelation says, are going to be done away with. They're going to pass. And, and the future glory has now come. This is where we're headed. From frustration to freedom. Here's the last one. Write it down, and we're going to close. We're headed from decay to deliverance. Decay to deliverance. I'm going to say something that is a hard truth for me to swallow. And those of you that are over 40, you're like, dude, Get with the program. <laughs> Our bodies are decaying, right? And 20-year-olds, if you're under 20 or if you're even under 30, you probably don't understand that, and we hate you for it. Let's just, let's just be honest, right? <laughs> but, but our bodies are decaying, right? Uh, we're, 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 we're decaying, but there's going to be a day where even these bodies are going to be redeemed, not, not to the, their perfect uh, that we were one day perfect and in our youth, but, but to Christ's resurrected body, a body that is going to, to break down and, and it's not going to break down anymore. And a body that has gained weight is not going to gain weight anymore. And a body that has all these wrinkles and, and white hairs are not going to have all those things anymore. We're going to get our perfect bodies back. I watched just this last week uh, two uh, games in the NBA in which two guys scored over 70 points in one week. I mean, that's just unheard of, right? And you're seeing these guys do some amazing things on the basketball court. And I'm like, I wish I could do that. And I used to be able to do that in my 20s. But now, forget about it, right? My body is decayed. I, I don't play as much because I can't hang with the, the young guys. And I just feel like, like I don't know what, I, what I'm doing. But one day is coming when I'm going to be able to do that, everybody. And I'm going to enjoy the things that I used to. And how cool is it going to be that we're going to have these just glorified bodies from the decay to this deliverance? Uh, Joni Erickson Tata, if that name rings a bell, uh, she was uh, paralyzed as a teenager in a, in a freak um, diving accident. She's actually one of the very first books I ever read that my mom gave me to read. Uh, it was just called Joni. And here's what she says about her being in a wheelchair for all these many years. It's really fascinating. She says, when I get to heaven, I'm going to push my wheelchair to the throne of Jesus. And she says, notice, I'll be walking <laughs> I'm going to thank him for every character-refining work he did in me and through me because of this wheelchair. 
And then I'm going to ask Jesus to send that wheelchair straight to hell. <laughs> right? I love that. <laughs> Some of us are going to be like, Jesus, I know that you gave me this, and I wish I was 7'1", and I was playing in the NBA right now, but I'm a 6'1", white guy that's slow. I get it. Throw that straight to hell. Right? Give me this, like, delivered body. I want to be awesome in, in, in your presence. Because it was only needed, watch this, she says, relevant, because, man, wreckage of sin. And a day is coming, Romans 8 says, when we're not going, uh, not only is he going to make this world perfect, but your body is going to be made new and everlasting and perfect. Your current sufferings are not worth compared to the glory that's going to be revealed in us. When Christ returns, we're going to make everything new and all these struggles are going to pale, pale in comparison to the future hope that will be revealed to us. So what he's saying here. Okay, this is what I'm going to close with. We're uh, kind of running short on time here. It's a beautiful truth tucked away in this. Because we're anticipating these things to happen. We're moving into these things, that, right? But, but they haven't happened yet. But there is some encouraging news. Watch, watch the, how it ends. We don't know when the future is going to happen. We don't know when Christ will return. I believe we're at the end season, the end of the end times, right? Jesus could come back anytime we see it. But we don't know exactly when the day is coming. But, but watch who's with us every step of the way, no matter what comes our way. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. That, I mean, it's just such a beautiful picture. That even in the struggles, even as we wait, even as we groan, even as we toil, even as we're like decaying physically, even as we see the world kind of crumbling, even as we see everything around us just in frustration, futility, curse, the Holy Spirit is in us and he's helping us in those weaknesses. I love it. And then he says, but there's a specific weakness that sometimes gets the best of us, and he tells us what that is and how the Holy Spirit helps us. He says, we do not even know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. There are some things in us, there are some prayers, there are some challenges that we don't even have words to. We don't even know how to express them, and, and we don't even know what to say, and we're so torn, and, and that's when Holy Spirit is activated. That's when Holy Spirit comes and, hey, I got you. I know what to say, and I'm going to groan along with you because I know what's in your spirit. And the one who searches our hearts knows the mind of the spirit because the spirit intercedes for the saints, and I love this last part, in accordance with God's will. So he's praying God's will over you because what often happens, okay, I was debating whether I should show this. I'm going to show it. <laughs> it's a little clip, okay? This is, the, oh my gosh, okay. I'm going to get in trouble for this. Uh, sorry, but just watch this. This kind of expresses this lady's excitement about what's happening here. Okay. Holy Spirit, activate. Oh, no. Holy oh, Spirit, no. Oh, activate. No. Holy Spirit, activate. 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 All right, let's go. <laughs> okay, that's, that's kind of a funny thing, right? It's a Steve Harvey family. But that's exactly what it is. The Holy Spirit comes and he's activated when we don't know what to do. In our weaknesses as we're waiting and hoping for this glory and God, the sons of God are going to be revealed. What do we do? Holy Spirit, would you come and activate? Because here's what I know. Sometimes I pray amiss. Sometimes I don't know what to pray for. Sometimes I pray wrongly. And I can just imagine Holy Spirit coming and saying, actually, God, what he's actually trying to say is this. Like he's editing our prayers in real time. That's so amazing. And he's there with us groaning. And he's there with us. And he's in us. And he's walking alongside us. And he's our friend. And he says, you have the Spirit of God in you. And it's activated. You don't have have to do this pony and dog show like that lady did, Holy Spirit act. No, it's already activated. It's, it's in you. You're a son and child of the Most High God. You received the Spirit of God. He is in you. He is in you. That's what this passage is talking about. There's a hope that's coming when all things will be made right, but I love how it finishes. Until that day, the Holy Spirit is in you. Until that day when people mar you, when people say bad things about you, when people accuse you of certain things at your workplace or wherever it may be, Holy Spirit is saying, I got this. I got you. I know you can't fight back. I know you don't have the right words. I know you don't even know what to say. I'm going to pray for you. 
I'm going to lead you. I'm going to guide you in all your weaknesses. Powerful, powerful. It's all because of the goodness of God.